Candice, appreciate that intro. There we go. Thank you, Candice. Appreciate that intro. Hey, Jim, how's it going? Hey, Chris. Good. Going good here. I, ready. Uh, ready to ham and egg? Yeah, I think that people can probably tell from your, your title and my title that you're actually my boss, so I have to just behave myself. I, I work for you, Jim. Whatever yeah. you need, I'm there for you, bud. <laughs> So glad we can uh, all be here together with the folks on on the webinar. So we have a great agenda for you today. So just we'll do some quick introductions. Jim, you want to go first? Yes, I'm Jim Hatcher. I'm a solutions engineer at Cockroach Labs. Uh, I've been at Cockroach for about three years, but I've been working in uh, software and uh, databases uh, for about 25 years. Um, and uh, as you can see from my title, I'm not a manager but I'm thrilled to be on a call with a manager. <laughs> no, we're, we're all, before, Jim, before, you don't even you do yourself justice there, bud. Okay. Like you've been working for software, but before you got the software, what did you do? You know, you, you come from industry. So like, what, what, what did you do in some of your prior work? Well, um, yeah, one of my first jobs out of, out of school, I, I took a job at Chase Manhattan Mortgage Company. This was before Chase was JP Morgan Chase. Um, and I worked on a, a, a system where we uh, we had all these documents related to mortgages and the mortgage servicing world. And uh, so we had, you know, some databases with, I don't know, millions or billions of records, which at the time, you know, I thought was a lot. And um, and then, you know, I took a job as a web, uh, I started a company and, and started building websites uh, using uh, classic ASP, as it's now called. Uh, and SQL Server, and that was a neat job because I I got to build like I don't, know, I don't know dozens of websites for different companies, and for each one of those we build a you know custom backend and design a database, you know. Um, so that was a neat job for me because I got to really um, practice my skills at data modeling and and querying, and then I eventually got into uh, financial services. So I worked at um, First Data Corp for a while. Uh, and then I worked at a company called CyberSource, which is a big payment processor that later got bought by Visa. Uh, and then I worked at Western Union um, on a couple of systems related to risk management and fraud prevention. Uh, and those are the those are the jobs. And once I got into financial services, where I really started seeing scale, uh, you know, like like you know, kind of enterprise, you know, scale and mission critical systems. Um, and eventually, uh, because of some of the scale challenges. I, I got into I eventually got into NoSQL databases. Um, specifically, I did I did some work with HBase and then a lot of work with Cassandra. Um, and so I kind of got into the NoSQL world. Um, and I, so I worked with Cassandra for uh, I don't know maybe six seven years. And then uh, one day I discovered CockroachDB uh, and and the world of distributed SQL. And I thought that was a really really interesting technology. And um, that's, you know, that's what brings me here. I've been working at Cockroach for about three years and really, um, you know, uh, kind of seeing the the benefit of uh, what distributed SQL can do. So it's, um, uh, you know, I'm a, I consider myself a database guy. Uh, I, was, I mean, I, I coded a lot in my career, but I always loved the database end of things. So I, I love talking about databases. So happy to, happy to do some today. This is, you're the perfect person for this conversation today. This is going to be a little bit of history. We're going to talk a little bit about databases, yeah. challenges we've had over time with scale and so forth. So this is going to be fun. Um, and, you know, just to introduce myself. So I'm Chris Cassano. I, even though it says manager in my title, I work for Jim. If Jim needs something, I'm there to help him. And uh, kind of like Jim, i was been in the database industry for a long time. I think maybe not 25 years, probably more like 24, just maybe, a, you know, a little bit junior to Jim, but uh, I've been in all, all sorts of things with databases, with data warehousing, uh, search technology, you know, SQL technology, um, you know, uh, transaction processing workload. So I spent probably first 10 years of my career in, in consulting or professional services, doing large scale implementations where scale was important. And then the last 10 years uh, doing more things around solution engineering for uh, various different software companies. So uh, like I said, I think you're going to see a little bit of a history lesson here today of, you know, why, why distributed SQL? What have we tried to do in the past and what we can do today, which is a, it's become a rather really exciting uh, market, I guess, in the, in the database market. It's a new way of thinking. So let's get to it. What do you think, Jim? 
Should we move forward? I'm so excited. Let's do it. Uh, yeah, I think this is like 10 minutes on intro. So I think people want to see some uh, real, real, real things here. So let's talk about some real things. You know, if we look at, and Jim, I'm sure you would agree with this, like over time, you know, I've seen this in my career where um, there's all this, uh, you know, ideas of trying to do more, uh, more volume, right? I needed to do more query volume, more throughput. And the database that I currently have is not good enough. I need more database, right? And however that, however you try to get there, uh, folks try to do weird things over the course of time by trying to distribute a SQL database. And it hasn't been easy. And usually these are the, the main things that I've seen in the past. And I think you've probably seen the same thing. Usually it's scale. Scale is kind of the big one, right? I need more query throughput or I need a lower latency. I need more CPU power to like lower, make queries faster or have massive data volume that I can't fit on one server, I need multiple servers. Um, and then to a lesser extent, I've seen locality come up. Um, obviously scale is probably number one, locality has probably been number two where, you know, they want a lower latency by bringing data closer to, to users or data needs to be, you know, more localized in a specific geography. Um, so this is what I've seen over the course of time. I mean, do, do you agree, Jim, or anything that you've seen that's, that's not listed here? Well, yeah, especially in that OLTP world where, you know, you're not doing big batch scans of data like you might be doing in the data help, data warehousing or, you know, machine learning or something like that. But in that OLTP world where you know, you're powering a website or you're powering an API and you're, you're doing like, you know, lots of little reads, lots of little writes, um, you know, that, you know, uh, yeah, the, 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 the scale in terms of just pure you know, throughput, you know, how many transactions per second can I do? I used to do a thousand. I need to do 2000. Now, how do I do that? Um, or I used to do hundred thousand. I need to do 200,000. Now, how do I, how do I do that? Or, uh, you know, we, we, we've all seen these statistics about how, how much data is growing and how much data exists in the world, you know, like used to be like a terabyte of data and a database was, it was a huge, huge database, you know, and, and, um, you know, in today, today's world, you know, there, it's not, it's not hard to get into tens of terabytes or, uh, you know, push into, you know, much larger data sizes. So, um, uh, yeah, yeah, I definitely agree. And, you know, um, you know, scale, uh, you, you, you could, I mean, you talk about scale, you, there's lots of things you can be scaling out. I mean, usually we're talking about, you know, all these, you know, distinct queries that we're doing, but, yeah, you can be you can scale to to multiple data centers, or you can, um, you know, there, there's there's lots of pressure on different you know dimensions of your of your uh, you know your 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 topology and your um, your setup. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. It's, and then you know, there's even scale of just managing tons of databases, right? So, um, yeah. but I mean, this is you know, and we're going to be pretty particular today. We're going to focus mostly on transaction processing and OLTP type of workloads. I've seen the same thing in other spaces, whether it's OLAP and search. I remember back in my search days, we do, um, you know, um, we would shard, you know, all these search indexes, and that was so, such a hard thing to maintain too. But, um, but yeah, so we're going to fo mostly focus on transaction processing and you know why distributed SQL can, you know. Uh, reduce a lot of pain that we've seen as far as the solutions that we've had over the course of time. So, you know, if we bring it back to what folks have tried to do with distributed SQL at a really simple or fundamental level, it's this, right? You want to take SQL, you want to take schema, the writes that you have, the, the reads that you have by using SQL, and then be, being able to um, fan it out across all these different nodes or all these different servers so that you can do more throughput, that you can lower query latency, that you can bring data closer to end users. So this is kind of like a simplified, simplified form of what folks have wanted to do over the course of time. Um, hopefully that makes sense to everybody. I know it's like kind of an odd diagram that you see there, but it's basically you have schema, you have reads, you have writes, and you want to distribute this across a whole bunch of nodes. And the way that we've done this uh, historically is kind of fun it's kind of fun to talk about because we've seen um because there's been a lot of pain right it just this does bring you the the scale that you need but it brings you pain in other areas so it's been like the slide says a history of trade-offs um so i mean i think we should go into each one of these and kind of talk about maybe the trials and tribulations we've had with some of these but uh i don't know anything you want to add here jim as far as maybe the trade-offs you've seen over time yeah, I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot, um, 
implied in that last slide you had were you know creating a table inserting into the table and, and reading it um you know like th th there's all kinds of little decisions there um you know when you go from one one purple box to six purple boxes um uh you know i mean to, uh, historically a relational database you, you sit on one big box and you know all the consistency guarantees around foreign keys and unique indexes and the ability to do joins is all it's all built on the the assumption that it's all going to be in one big box uh, it's all in one one memory space where we're, we can i can check to see if there's referential integrity between these things because i'm working at memory speed uh, and as soon as you say well hey it sounds easy i'm just going to take that kind of work and i'm going to move it across six boxes there's there's all kinds of like gotchas and trade-offs like you said so um yeah i mean and um you know sharding i think um I, I'm a SQL Server guy for most of my career. Um, I can remember um, starting to see articles on, on you know, how can, how can you shard SQL uh, Server? And, you know, you, you'd read those and you'd think, well, okay, I, I kind of get how that helps. But that, man, it's a lot of, a lot of work because as soon as you go from one box to two boxes, you have to have some type of algorithm that says, how am I going to shard this data? I mean, am I going to split up my customer's table based on name and A through M goes on the first server and N through C goes on the next server? Um, and how does my application logic know that? And how you know how am I going to read the data? And what happens if I add a third server? Do I do I redistribute the data again? Um, and then and then what happens around acid transactions? Can I guarantee atomicity? What if I'm inserting a record into shard uh, on box one and shard on box two? Um, you know now I'm not dealing with with data in one memory space. And so how can I um, you know how, how can I give uh, guarantees of atomicity and consistency and isolation? And so um, it just creates all these headaches. And generally what happens is those headaches kind of migrate up into the app layer into some layer above the database. And I think what we all love about relational databases, is like the database handles so much for you. You know, you can, you model your data in a specific way and you, you put foreign keys on your data and, uh, you know, I can join the data and it, and it's, and it all just works, you know, like the, the data handles the data stuff and up in my app, I deal with the, the app logic. So, um, you know, that's, I think that's the, the pain point with sharding, um, you know, in, uh, in, in the NoSQL world, my, my journal, my journey with NoSQL um, comes from Cassandra and Cassandra, um, you know, it, it does that sharding of data for you. That's one of the great things about NoSQL is it's, um, you know, it's a, it's a terrible name, by the way, NoSQL, um, it, you know, it, it's really be like no relational or something, but um, you know, in, in the there's lots of flavors of NoSQL, but generally they all share the attributes that they're horizontally scalable. That I can add more and more nodes to the server cluster to to allow for scale. But they introduce all these same trade offs. Um, you know, the, the the sharding is kind of handled for you. But how do I deal with um, you know concurrency handling in the data? How can I do joins? Like in Cassandra, you can't do joins. Um, and, you know, some, so, you know, different flavors of NoSQL, you know, let you do different things, but generally speaking, you know, you, you're trading off, you're saying I'm to get the scale that I want and to get the resiliency and the high availability I want, uh, I'm going to give up on the consistency. I'm going to give up on concurrency handling. I'm going to give up on joins. I'm going to model my data differently. And so these are all sort of like, you know, if you're depending on the use case you're looking at, like you might, you have to look at that trade off and say, man, do I, how much do I care about that scale versus how much do I not want this headache of, you know, having to deal with all this stuff. Yeah. Um, so a lot of times it's a forced trade-off too, right? The business needs to scale. And then all of a sudden you have to do all these things where the app team needs to change the way the app behaves. And then the database operations team needs to coordinate how they're going to do, you know, backups across all these different shards and so forth. So it's, 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 it's like one of those things we've lived with the pain of, of having, having to do it because the business needs to run this way. Yeah. Um, so, you know, part of the reason why, you know, cockroach was founded was because of all of these pains, right? Like, and, and I think this gives the advent to the distributed SQL market is that we've seen this pain for a long time. So there's gotta be a better way to reimagine some of these things. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, as you can see here, these are kind of like the, hey, there's probably more than, than the three that you see here, but the, I would say these are like the top three avenues, that we've taken over the course of time as far as how we handle scale, right? There's that sharding use case where I almost look at these as like trying to manage your kids, right? So if you look at the sharding use case, you're taking your kids and you're putting each kid isolated from each other, right? And they don't know what, 
you know, they have no way to communicating with each other and they're all being told what to do in their own little world, right? So you don't have a team essentially, right? You have all these like silo databases that need to help support your particular application, right? You, um, do, you, do you actually do that with your kids, Chris? I do, I keep them all, they all stay in their separate rooms. They're not allowed to come out and talk to each other yeah. at all, right? Can you imagine, imagine trying to do that with your family? Um, try, imagine trying to shard your family, it would be terrible. Yeah. <laughs> um, but then the next one, like I'm going to use a kid analogy again with no sequel, right? So imagine having inconsistency, right? You know, uh, inconsistency with your discipline, right? You discipline kids in a different way or you give them rewards in different ways. That's going to drive all kinds of different behaviors. And that's what you kind of see with no sequel, right? In, in some cases where you don't have trans transaction management like you did with SQL databases, this can be a big headache for mission critical systems, especially that deal with things like money, right? <laughs> um, having in inconsistencies around currency or money is, is a, a big issue. And then the last one, like leader worker, right? Imagine just telling you one kid that, hey, you're the leader, everybody else doesn't matter, right? Like you're, 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 the, you're the, the favorite child, right? Can, can you imagine trying to run families this way? And this is what we've done. We've managed databases this way. <laughs> <laughs> um, to try to get the best out of them. And there's all these trade-offs that come along with it, right? That the trade-offs on consistency, trade-offs on database operations, um, just to, you know, to match scale. So I think we've all felt this for, for decades now, and there's got to be a better way, right? What do you think, Jim? You think there's got to be a better way? I'm hoping there's another slide after this one. That... <laughs> yeah, there's got to be a better way. So um let me let me click through here a little bit more. So this kind of speaks to kind of what we've seen, right? Historically. And there is definitely a better way. And then I think the the industry right now with distributed SQL has reimagined this a bit. Um, but Jim, I know you're actually really passionate about this slide, right? Isn't this like one of your favorite ones to to talk through? It is. I mean, it's it's laid out as a, a quadrant of agility and reliability on one side and scale and availability on the other side. And so you can see, you know, kind of this upward trend towards, you know, cloud native distributed SQL. That's kind of the mecca. But for me, it reads like a timeline of my career um, because, you know, early in my career, you know, I, I learned about, uh, you know, relational databases, what we're calling legacy databases here at I remember in college taking my my first database course and we got to the section on data modeling and like I had this like you know light bulb going off my above my head moment where I was like I love this like you know when we started talking about you know third normal form and just the elegance of data modeling and every every piece of data belongs in one place in the database um, and then you started getting to, into SQL and what is a join and what's an inner join versus a left join and you. Um, you know, I, I was like, this is a really neat part of, of building systems. And then you know, early in my career, when I was working with, um, you know, kind of smaller systems, you know, I, I, I modeled lots of databases and, and uh, you know, I got really good at building, you know, writing queries, man. I kind of pride, prided myself as being like this, the query master. And, um, and oh, yeah. you know, it's I great as right. a developer, uh, when your, your database is handling the stuff you want it to handle and you're just working on fixing business problems, you know? Yeah, and 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 relational databases are great for that uh, until you get to you know you know enterprise scale problems, and th and then the database starts to be a problem for you, and you you know the the business comes to you and says I need to quintuple the size of the database, and you're like oh my god I can't buy a server that's big enough to to do that, um, you know or I need to spend you know all this money on a big SAN with the you know, expensive cash and. Um, you know, and you, you, but you just run into these this, these ceilings, and you're just banging your head against the ceiling. So, for me, I you know I got to a point where I, I was starting to build systems that were bigger and bigger, and so I I got into NoSQL databases. Like I've got to have scale, and so when I got into Cassandra, I was like, man, this is awesome the way this thing scales out. But I had to give up third normal form modeling. I had to give up foreign keys. I had to give up you know unique indexes, and I had to give up joins, and that just all felt like wrong to me. But it was like. <laughs> But but yeah. when when you need it when you need the scale you don't have a choice you know or at least you know that's the way it was you know ten years ago when I first started getting into that um, and then you know the cloud augmented legacy databases you know the the cloud has some awesome you know features including just um, you know the, the the ability to to quickly go from you know one server to ten servers you know has that elasticity 
uh, and the ability to, to, to respond to things quickly. I don't have to, you know, go go fill out an order form and wait six months for some service to show up on the the loading dock, you know, to get to get new hardware. Um, and so you, know, you started seeing like things like you know Amazon Aurora, where you know the storage later, you know, is able to take care take advantage of some of the elasticity of the cloud. So those those cloud features are really nice, but you still have the physics problems of how do I scale the data and how do I model the data. So you know, when when I learned about Cockroach and and I heard that Cockroach is a distributed SQL database, meaning it it's kind of the best of both worlds between legacy data relational and NoSQL uh, and and some of the cloud features. Like I, I was like, that sounds really cool, and I'm also very skeptical that it actually does what it says it does. <laughs> And so I started playing, you know, with Cocker specifically, um, and and I found that wow, it really it really does, you know, you know, it, it gives me this the consistency guarantees I want from a relational database. It gives me the acid transactions I want. Uh, lets me model the data the way I want to and use the tools, the SQL based tools. But it has that horizontal scale uh, of a NoSQL database. And um, you know, it it takes care of that effort. You know, I can I can go from a three node cluster to a ten node cluster, and that kind of auto scaling of you know auto um, balancing of the data is just just built in, and replicating data it's just built in. Um, you know that you know. So anyway, I I, I started drinking the cockroach Kool Aid, and really kind of um, uh, yeah. So I, I I like this slide. I sort of feel like uh, this has been the journey of my career. Like. Um, you know, the to to kind of feel the pain of each one of these along the way, and now to kind of live in a world where, hey, you know, I can I can uh, have my cake and eat it too. Yeah, it's exciting. Now I'm hungry, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, you know, I think you stole a lot of what I was going to say. I mean, I, this is this is spot on. This is exactly what you know I've I've seen too in the past, and. uh you know, it was funny, like just databases in general. I love databases. I remember just when I was starting my career and getting started with uh, SQL, I remember there was things I'd learned in, in math. I was a math major in college and there was things I learned in math class. I'm like, I don't understand. I, why I have to learn any of this stuff? Where does it apply? And then all of a sudden you start using databases and it's like, oh my gosh, look at all the fascinating things that are tangible or real that you could do that are all math-based. I remember like learning about unions and intersects. I'm like, Oh yeah, I kind of remember learning that in logic. I didn't know why it was useful, but now I do. <laughs> like, yeah. if you're trying to union or intersect data, this is you could just easily do it with SQL. So, all the stuff was a lot of fun. But yeah, I think once we got into those scale situations, then it's when it got really nerve wracking. And then uh, I'm so glad there's a better way. And then you know, a lot of what um, our founders and uh, Cockroach and other distributed SQL companies as well, all inspired from from this long history of dealing with this right like being in the industry and dealing with this and trying to imagine a better way and then we've actually come up with a better way and we think that you know there's a whole new market a whole distributed sql market that it's really um comprised of these like five tenants right so distributed sql it needs to be it needs to be sql first of all like that was something we don't want to give up again um you know for folks like jim and i that have been doing this for 20 plus years love sql right why, why would we want to give that away or change that it's, it's so universal and uh, friendly for anybody that needs to talk to data. Um, the next one, scale, right? We've talked about that countlessly today. <laughs> uh, there's got to be an easier way to scale, you know, both vertically and horizontally. Consistency is another one. Like, why give that up? Why put us in a position where we have to make a choice around data consistency or not? Why not just include it as being the default? Like, data is always consistent, right? That's that's wonderful. <laughs> And then the last two, I think because of the way, um, because of the architecture, these are kind of bonus features that you get with it. It's kind of like a, a batteries included option for having distributed SQLs. The one is resiliency, right? So that's being able to incur failures and having been in the distributed um, systems space for a number of years, and Jim, you were too with, you know, wor uh, working with Cassandra, there's so many different failures that can happen in a distributed system, and it's gotten so much better over the course of, of time. Um, but you know, just really living those years, I mean, trying to manage state and trying to manage what you know um, <laughs> configurations between all the different nodes. I mean, it was it was just hard with distributed systems, and it's gotten so much better to the point where you act, you can actually rely on them. You know, they are fault tolerant in a lot of different ways. You can lose a node, you can lose a rack, you can lose 
entire data center and still have resilience. Um, so that's like kind of another key feature that's like a batteries included option that comes with these distributed SQL systems. And the last one I think that's really kind of nifty and new is this whole idea around geo-replication, right? Because you have a distributed SQL system now that can span not just data centers, but different regions of the world, um, you can do some nifty things. Uh, you know, I have one customer kind of describe what you can do with, with, with Cockroach as being almost like a, um, how do they describe it? He described it as like a, um, um, geez, I'm forgetting the term. Of course, it's going to happen right in the middle of the webinar. I forget, I, I lose my thought. Um, it's like a, almost like a mesh of, um, like a network mesh of, of servers. Is that that's the term you're looking for? Yeah, like um, with some CDN. That's, that's what I can remember. Oh. Content Delivery Network, right? So like Cloudflare, like it's a, you can have data pushed all the way out to where it needs to be localized, right? So it's think of a CDN, but also with transactions, right? So imagine being able to do that. That's kind of what a distributed SQL database gives you, right? You have being able to push data all the way to the edges of where it needs to be consumed or accessed, but then also have a ways of, of handling, you know, acid transactions traditionally, like you've seen just in single uh, relational databases. Yeah. So, also the, the ability to deal with uh, compliance things like GDPR, where you've got some data that that's required us to stay in Europe. Um, and you've got other data that it's okay to kind of span a cluster that that's in across Europe and North America, for instance. Um, you, you can, uh, Chris, you, uh, you have some children that you actually keep in Europe and that you don't let your kids in America know about, right? And then I was just trying to extend that metaphor. Sorry. Yeah, no, they, they always travel with us. I wouldn't, I wouldn't okay. be that bad of a father. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but you know, one day it will happen. One day they'll go on their own. They'll go to college, you know, they'll meet a significant other and they'll travel along the world and then we'll just be a distributed, distributed family. So, yeah. um, my wife's family is more like that. They're distributed all over the world. And, you know, my family is all from Long Island uh, in New York and no one ever leaves Long Island. So it's like, you know, that speaks well to data residency. If you're from Long Island, you, pr you pretty much stay there for your entire life. It's like localizing data there. It's, that's what we do. We just stay in Long Island. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, you know, think of when you think of the distributed SQL market, these are the five things to keep in keep your eyes on, right? It's another way of reimagining what we've done in the SQL world all, you know, through the course of time. And now is a better way of, of thinking about not just how to scale, but how to do, you know, how to scale without having to stress out your application team, without having to stress out your database operations team and being able to do these things in a, these things in a different way. Um, the last thing is kind of another bonus to, uh, you know, a lot of these databases too, um, can also be cloud agnostic, right? They not tied into one particular, um, you know, cloud provider. You can put them and deploy them where you see where you see fit. Uh, whether it's, you know, different clouds, whether it's on-prem infrastructure, even Kubernetes. I know we're doing this today for the Linux Foundation. I know you know Kubernetes is very big in the the Linux Foundation. Uh, Cockroach and some of these other databases all run in Kubernetes, which is a weird thing to think about, right? If you think about Kubernetes, you think about, you know, stateless apps. Why, why would you put a stateful database on Kubernetes? Well, because of the distributed nature of it, it allows you to actually handle failures. Like if a pod goes down, like the database can, can maintain its state and still be able to, to, to be resilient and serve the, the communities of of the applications or services that are accessing it. So that's another one. And then of course, security, right? Distributed SQL systems are not gonna really exist out in the marketplace unless they're fully secure. Enterprises are not gonna adopt them unless they're, they have full-blown security. So these are the key things. If you're looking at distributed SQL and you have these you know, five to seven things in mind, this is one good way to start looking at some of these distributed SQL systems. Uh, Jim, anything you'd add? We should check the Q and A too. See if we got any Q and A going on here. Oh, we do. We have a question. All right. So we have a question from Ali. Doesn't geographic aspect does the doesn't the geographic aspect require to have a backend close to? Uh, it does, right? So you know, if you think about 
a, geogra uh, a database that's going to be geographically distributed, you have to have infrastructure in those geographies as well, right? So, um, so yeah, the back end, I mean, especially in cloud, this is rather useful, right? If you think about all the regions that a lot of the cloud providers have, you can spin up infrastructure in those regions, and then you can have these distributed data SQL databases spread across or, uh, or, or um, located in each of these different regions, but all communicate together. And so that you have one logical database that just spreads across all these geographies. So pretty cool thing. Before, you know, before trying to do that, it was replication gymnastics, right? You'd have one primary <laughs> database and then and I would have to replicate over here and then maybe I have to replicate to another region. Um, then if you have, you know, if you're trying to coordinate this with multiple rights, right? And you have rights from all these different databases and you have to sync the data between all these different regions and reconcile it, it's, it's a lot of gymnastics. But being able to do this in one database that can spread across all these different regions and have consistency, have reads and writes that can be done anywhere, really opens the doors for uh, simplifying your architecture. Yeah, I guess we could touch on cl cloud agnosticity. Is that a word, agnosticity? It's a new word today. You yeah. Just invented it, Jim. It's yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, that, that that's an interesting concept. I and mean, we, we talked a little bit about uh, cloud augmented databases and, you know, they're they're kind of the quote unquote cloud databases out there. You think about Google Spanner, you think about Amazon Aurora or Amazon RDS or Amazon DynamoDB and, uh, you know, Microsoft has uh, Cosmos. Um, they have a lot of interesting features and um, they, you know, they, they, they would fall under the umbrella of distributed SQL. Um, but the, you know, one, one, one kind of thing to think about if you're, if you're considering going, moving to one of those databases is, um, you know, like if you go to Amazon Aurora uh, and it runs in Amazon and if you decide one day, I don't want to run an Amazon anymore, well, you can't run Amazon Aurora. Um, you know, and, and there, you know, there are certainly, uh, vendors out there. I mean, Amazon keeps moving into different spaces. I don't mean to pick on Amazon, but, um, you know, you hear about Amazon bought a pharmacy company, Amazon bought a, you know, banking company, Amazon bought a transportation company. All of a sudden you find yourself, uh, Amazon's a competitor to you. <laughs> uh, and so you think, oh, I need to move off of, you know, DynamoDB. And so that means you have to, you know, migrate your whole database to something else because you, I can't take that Amazon DynamoDB and run it on-prem or move it to GCP or something. So, um, you know, when, when, you know, there are, there are several flavors of distributed SQL, including Cockroach um, that are cloud agnostic. So they offer the same type of features that are available in the cloud and they offer the cloud native aspects of some of those things. You know, they can take advantage of elasticity. They can take advantage of the scale of the cloud. Uh, but they can run in any cloud. So, um, you know, Cockroach, for instance, you know, we can run on IaaS resources um, uh, and you, you, you can even have a multi-cloud, you know, a deployment where, uh, you know, you, you've got a deployment of Cockroach where there's a single cluster, but it, you, you've got some nodes running in AWS, some in Azure and some in GCP. Um, and so that, you know, for, for certain use cases that, that cl cloud agnosticity, as we've defined the term, uh, can be an important factor, um, whether you're trying to uh, survive, you know, have a, you have a survival goal of, I want to, I want to be able to operate even if Amazon US East one goes down, you know, um, uh, or, you know, you just want to have some, you know, leverage <laughs> and when you're re negotiating your cloud contract, you know, just to say, Hey, look, I, I can move off of this cloud if I need to, um, you know, so there's some, there's some interesting benefits there that I think are, are worth considering. Yeah. yeah, portability is a big one, right? Um, being able to run air anywhere should be, you know, you shouldn't be constrained to being, you know, only locked into one place. It should be, you should always be portable. Um, yeah, so um, this kind of sums up what you can see with like distributed SQL databases now. Uh, so, you know, folks, folks here might, might not have seen a database just like this, but here's what you'll kind of see in this space now is that you'll have a database that's kind of the middle layer that you see there with all those purple boxes, where all these nodes or all these servers, uh, in Cockroach's case, every node can take a read or a write. Um, some of these distributed databases can't always do that, but 
Uh, that's the idea, right? You want to be able to distribute the workload across all these different nodes. Any node can take a read or a write. And a new interesting way of accessing that is through a load balancer. <laughs> and, um, you know, you always think load balancers in front of other things, but, um, but in front of a database is kind of an interesting thing. But what you're doing is basically round robbing the traffic around each of the different nodes of the database because you don't want all the traffic to go to one node. There's some, you know, there's those cloud augmented databases that we mentioned before where you have to do that, right? Like all writes need to go through one primary writer and then that gets all the traffic. And then there's probably read or read replicas that don't get that right traffic. Um, but in this new world, you could just send the, your reads and writes everywhere. Um, now, what this gives you is that you have that all, all of a sudden you have this horizontal scale and you have vertical scale too, but you have this, you know, um, theoretically endless amount of nodes that you can add, you know, you can add to a database. So this is useful if you're scaling, you could just scale kind of on demand. And some of these databases allow you to just scale without any downtime. That's a big piece here is that um, because of the way the systems are architected, you know, plan downtime and um, actually we say unplanned downtime is love, you know, it's not, not as, um, not as critical as it used to be because these distributed systems can tolerate failures a lot better. But where this changes the game is plan downtime, right? Instead of having to say, all right, everyone come in on a Saturday because we're gonna do the upgrade or because we're gonna uh, upgrade our Linux uh, versions or so forth. Now it just becomes just taking a node out of service, doing the, the maintenance that you need and adding it back into the cluster, right? So plan downtime can actually be done intraday. You know, it doesn't have to be done on the weekend. So a lot of good goodies that come with this type of architecture. And the main ones are really at the bottom of the slide there, right? It's built-in resilience. The built-in resilience gives you all that, all that goodness for unplanned downtime, but also for planned downtime. Horizontal and vertical scale we mentioned. Automatic data sharding. This is a lovely one, right? <laughs> Instead of having to have your apps team stay, all right, you know, you, you see we have the three apps and services up, up top. If we had a shard of database, we'd say, all right, you know, app service one, you go to database one, app service two, you go to database two. Now all they have to do is just connect to the load balancer. So to your app developers, it looks like they're connecting to a single instance database. But underneath the covers, there could be hundreds of nodes, hundreds of nodes behind that load balancer, right? So you abstract all that away from the app developers so they could just develop their app and just point to one endpoint, you know, to access the database. So all that sharding is all done in the back end for you, which is just, it was just lovely. It really is. It's just such a lovely feature. Um, and then lastly, we talked about geographic distribution, right? Being able to service these nodes all, all throughout different regions and data centers and so forth. And one, one thing I'll point out here is, uh, it, it, this is this is kind of inferred, but there's there's replication involved. So you know when you when you write a piece of data um, into a into a distributed SQL database, you, you expect that that data is actually going to be written in several several places. So you might imagine, you know, I'm going to write this customer record, and it's going to end up uh, actually in like nodes one, two, and three here. Um, so that that you know by having the, the the data replicated in multiple places, it means you know, that's part of the reason we're able to do things like, you know, hey, I'm going to go take take node one down and we're going to patch the OS is because that data is actually on several, you know, in several places. Um, and so um, I think that, uh, you know, some of the some of the magic of distributed databases is that 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 all feels um, just trans transparent. Like you, your application doesn't even really know that that's happening. It's all handled at the data layer. So um uh, and 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 when you when you talk about you know we're we're going to replicate the data we're going to distribute it across you know, multiple copies of the data multiple places and then we're also going to have a, a highly consistent database you know those are those are two things that are very much at odds with each other <laughs> how, how do you keep multiple copies of the data and keep it totally in sync and totally consistent and so i think that's that's where the magic um of of kind of having a sql layer um that sits on top of a the distributed storage system because you know when we talk about sql in the simplest sense we mean the language but you know sql implies there's data consistency there's joins you know the the, the things we expect from a relational database that you know i'm not going to write into a table immediately read that data back and get some other value and think well that's that's weird you know why 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 isn't my data consistent you know that that um 
that 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 layer that, that that maintains the consistency across multiple um replicas is is really important yeah perfect cool well you know what i, I want to be cognizant of our time we actually have a couple of questions in the qa actually i don't want to go to thank you let's just let's go to some questions and if folks have questions from our presentation take feel free to fill them up in the qa we'll, we'll get to a couple so uh you know let's let's pick off a couple so uh, vikran asked a great question is cockroach db open source it is. You can actually go see, you know, and this, this is in the spirit of the Linux Foundation as well. If you want to go see, um, you know, CockroachDB, you can go to GitHub, uh, GitHub slash CockroachDB, and you can see the, the source code there if you'd like to. Uh, you know, we do take, you know, uh, community contributions as well. So uh, we love being an open source. It's a great, great tool for, uh, for us to engage with partners, with, to engage with customers. So yeah, uh, Cockroach DB is open source. So thanks for the great, great question, uh, Vikram. All right, so we have another one from Bokar, uh, wondering if agnostic means no dependency to a cloud provider. So since Jim coined the phrase agnoc agnosticity, did I say that right? You did, yeah. That, okay. Uh, you you want to answer that one? Yeah, I mean that you know the term agnostic in general means so I'm not. I'm not relying on one. So like, uh, yeah, I mean, if we say cloud agnostics, you're, you're, we just mean there's no, we don't care what cloud, you know, we're not, we're not married to one cloud. Um, so um, there's probably a family metaphor in there, but I'll skip past it. Okay. Uh, All right, cool. So uh, we have another question from Samson. Is there a, uh, a leader worker in the cluster? Uh, Great question, Samson. So, in this case, there are um, there isn't like a traditional. So, if we go back to a couple of slides, right? Um, let me see if I can just click back. Right. So, if we have this leader worker set up like you have here in the bottom of the slide, where right there, there's uh, this no, this node or server all the way on the left with the W, that would be the writer, and then you'd have all these readers. Um, Cockroach is architected a little bit differently. Uh, so this would be kind of like more of a leader worker setup. The way Cockroach works, and we don't have a good slide to show you this here today, is that all the data is sharded across all of the different uh, nodes. And these shards are, are, we call them ranges, but each one of those ranges has, has a leader. And that leader will help coordinate the reads and writes. So what happens is that you have reads and writes that can be done all over the cluster because it's, now it's distributed. So instead of thinking of a leader at a node level, a leader is really at a, a shard or a range level, and that's how um, and that's how the distributed reads and writes work within within Cockroach. Okay, um, let's go to the next question. All right, so Sam is saying uh, I am new to this database. Is it possible to run distributed SQL database on a single in-house multi-core server for intranet access only, or does it always require a, a cloud connection? What are the names of distributed SQL databases that you recommend to be used? Okay. Um, you made to take that one? Yeah, sure, sure. Go for it. So uh, yeah, for, for, for Cockroach, um, Cockroach DB, we, we replicate the data um, three times by default. Um, so for a Cockroach cluster, the minimum size you want is three nodes. And that way you're able to... Um, you know, have, have one replica per node. And so in, in that configuration, you can take one of the nodes down and do some maintenance, bring it back up, you know, do the next one. So, so to get to get that kind of, you know, high availability, minimum size you want is three, even for like a dev network. So we, we do have the ability to like spin up Cockroach on your laptop in a single node uh, configuration. That's really just for, you know, it's not something you'd, you'd want to, certainly not for production, probably not even for dev, but if you just want to kind of play with uh, queries. And when, when you run in that mode, you just create one replica um, so, you know, if you, you know, there's no taking down to the node and still getting, getting to the data elsewhere. Cause there's just one copy of it. Yeah. So, and it, Sam, just to answer the second part of your question too. So yeah, you can totally run Cockroach specifically. You can run in, you know, uh, in-house if you wanted to on-prem, you know, usually you'd run it across multiple servers instead of like one big multi-core server. Um, just because it's, it's a distributed system, like running a distributed system on a single database, I mean, on a single server, doesn't really give you the uh, the, the benefits that you, we've kind of called out here today. Um, 
You also asked like, what are the names of distributed SQL databases that are used out there? Uh, so, I mean, obviously Cockroach, you know, Spanner was kind of one of the first ones that, that were kind of pioneered this space. Um, and then there's some other ones as well. There's, um, there's TidyB and Yugabyte and some others, but, uh, and then Jim mentioned a couple with, uh, with Aurora, but they do follow more of like a leader worker type of arrangement. Uh, all right, so thank you for the question, Sam. And um, let's see, let's go to another one. All right, the questions are really starting to come in now. Uh, so Ollie's asking, is there a separate node to ensure all database upgrade up to ensure all database updates migrations? Okay, so I guess he's asking if there's a coordinator that does all the database upgrade updates and migrations. Um, I could take, you wanna take Jim? Uh, sure, I'm happy to take it. So, um, yeah, so Cockroach, you know, the, the, the queries coming in, you know, the requests coming in, select statements, update statements, et cetera, you know, those get round robin between between the nodes. Um, and like Chris said, uh, we, we break data down into ranges. So, and those ranges are done by size. So if you have like a customer table, um, you know, with millions of records, we'll, we'll break that, that customer table down into ranges of about 512 megs in size and the, the the records within that range will be sorted by the primary key and then each one of those ranges gets replicated three times so like on this diagram you might see you know customer one the the, the range where customer one through i don't know 200 they're all uh they're they're replicated uh on on nodes one two and three and one of those replicas will be the leaseholder and all the writes have to go through the leaseholder and all the reads have to go through the leaseholder um, and then when, when you, when, when you write, you have to the leaseholder plus at least one other copy. So that's where the, we need quorum. So, um, anyway, so that, that's kind of, that's kind of the basic mechanism. And then we use the raft protocol of cockroach, which is a distributed consensus protocol to make sure that, um, you know, that we can guarantee the atomicity of, you know, rights. Uh, um, and so, um, but. Uh, that that but but those leaseholders can move around so like say node 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 one was the leaseholder and so you're writing through there and you're doing your reads through there if that node went down uh there's mechanisms where within those ranges they're kind of gossiping and talking to each other and saying are you up are you up you're up and there's a process called lead, lead leader election where if if say node one goes down um the the, the nodes will say hey we lost our leader uh and you know basically one of the other replicas because we'll become the leader, uh, and then um, you know, and then there's some auto healing things built in where hey, well, now we have two of the three replicas available. Uh, we might need to create a third replica to get us back into a fully replicated state. So, um, so at any any given point in time, there is like one node that you need to talk to, but that but that node is not like written in stone, and your app doesn't need to know where it is. Your app just needs to say, as long as I can connect to Cockroach, Cockroach is going to route me to the right place. Um, so it, um, you know, so like the, you, you can read and write to any node and that, and any node you talk to might have to, uh, redirect you to some other nodes to involve those, those leaseholder activities. But, um, you know, most that's, that's all kind of transparent to the app, you know, as far as you're concerned, you're just talking to this one single, you know, load balancer and, you know, you're getting your reads and your writes done. So. Cool. We definitely have a, I know we're just about out of time, but we have a few more questions. Let's try to hit them if we can. So I love David's questions here. He asked, can you give a customer use case examples where geo-replication has been used for localized read and write requirements? Any examples would be good. Could be local compliance, uh, control data access from other regions. Uh, sorry for the newbie question, but very interested in uh, what you had to say today. So yeah, we've actually run into this a lot. So a lot of the use cases that tend to come to distributed SQL are the same use cases you know of today, right? It's really about modernization of the same use cases that you know. Um, where we've seen this, especially with like geo-replication or being able to you know, span the data out to multiple different regions, a lot of the our SaaS provider clients or customers, right? Where um, you know they have customers accessing their service from different parts of the world and they wanna have data locally. So this use case is, you know, sometimes we refer to it as metadata, right? It's metadata for powering a particular service or, or for, for a SaaS provider. We see that, you know, the multi-region use case be, you know, used predominantly for those types of um, use cases. 
uh, identity access management is another one, right? So if you think about identity management, when users need to authenticate or you know be authorized to see data, again, if you can push that the those authentication authorization data out as closer to the users, they'll authenticate or authorize faster. So um, so yeah, it's a bunch of interesting use cases. Like I said, this is they're the same use cases you've known all throughout these years. They're just different ways of reimagining it in a distributed SQL environment. Yeah, typically, typically either yeah. you're trying to get the data closer for latency purposes, uh, or you're trying to get the data in certain places for compliance reasons. I would say. Yeah, All right, we're we're gonna hit some quick easy ones. So Shakar asked, "Will it work in containers?" Quick answer is yes. <laughs> if you want to run cockroach in containers, you you absolutely can. Um, we work very well in Kubernetes. Um, what else do we have here? Uh, there was a question around anonymous attendee asked, is Cockroach DB suitable for OLAP workloads? Uh, typically, we're, is Cockroach purpose built for OLTP workloads? There's some OLAP things that we can do, but it's not our primary wheelhouse. OLTP is really the, the main wheelhouse. Uh, let's see. Question here about whether we prefer certain Linux distributions and answer there is we we don't we we're pretty uh linux agnostic as well uh we 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 either usually in production we run on linux or unix um uh, we, we we can run in windows but we don't really recommend it for production uh okay cool so we have a, a again another anonymous question do you have kpis for distributed sql versus the traditional sequels with replication in three nodes, as Jim mentioned, what is the trade-off from SQLs to new SQLs? Great question. This comes up all the time. Uh, folks ask us all the time, what are the benchmarks? How do you compare benchmarks? Your best benchmarks are your own, right? So you can take any of the standard benchmarks out there, TPCC, YCSB, there's a ton of them, right? Um, your best benchmarks are your own. And, you know, uh, because, you know, like Cockroach is a distributed SQL system, there's there's a small penalty you pay for doing you know for doing a write right because you're going to another node to make sure that we have data consistency. In a single instance database, you don't have to pay that penalty, right? So you can be a little bit faster there. Um, so uh, what we might make for you know the trade off might be for query latency, you get all these other things as far as resilience, horizontal scale, online schema changes. So the like I said, the best thing to really do is look at your own benchmarks or looking at performance. You know, like I said, the, the performance in Cockroach is, is awesome. Um, it will probably never be as high performance for writes like you would have on a single instance database. So you just have to keep that, keep that in mind. Uh, all right, we could probably take about maybe one more question. I don't know, Jim, do you have anything teed up? Otherwise I'll look through this laundry list of great questions we have here. <laughs> Yeah, there's uh, Mark's asking about whether we support transactions. Um, so transaction being, you know, hey, I got to insert into the customer's table and also the custom, you know, the orders table and maybe the order item table. And I want to do that in a in a transaction where it's acid compliant, meaning it's atomic, it's uh, consistent, it's isolated and durable. Um, so we, we do. And um, the, the, the mechanism by which we do that is the raft protocol. Um, but basically, if you, you know, if you're going to write uh, like a multi-statement transaction, uh, you know, you, you 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 get round robin to the node um, that the load balancer sends you to. That that node we call the um, the the, co the coordinator node or gateway node, uh, and then it's responsible for figuring out what the right range is for each one of those inserts you're doing, and it co coordinates with the leaseholders, which might be on other nodes, um, and uh, you know, we, they, they, they create a right intent, which is like, Hey, I've written the, the, the data, but it's not committed yet. Um, and anyway, so that, that, that coordinator node, make sure that all that, um, those right happens to those various tables. And then when, when each one commits, then the commit, the transaction itself commits. So like in, yeah, in Cockroach, we, we provide full asset compliance. Um, and yeah, it's a, there's some, some, some pretty cool tech tech behind how, how all that happens. But, um, um, there, yeah. So it's there, there's no eventual consistency in cockroach. That's very you know strict consistency where a 
a CP system in the in the cap theorem that if that helps. Cool. Well, this is this was fun. I know we do have some more questions that are out there. I, I don't know. If maybe we can uh, follow up uh, through email with with some of these. But um, Candice, I might hand it back over to you to kind of wrap us up here. And uh, I just wanted to say thanks to everyone that joined the webinar today. Always fun doing these things. If you want to know more about uh, Cockroach in particular, we do have uh, Cockroach University where you can learn more. Um, but we hope today's session was great. And we'll kick it over to you, Candice. Thank you so much, Chris and Jim, for your time today, and thank you everyone for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. We hope you join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day.